If you would like to support the podcast, you can click the Buy Us a Coffee link on our show notes or on our website. Your support helps us keep the podcast going, and we appreciate each of our listeners so much. You can also rate and review us on Apple and Spotify, follow us on social media, and don't forget to tell your friends and family about us. I'm Darlene. And I'm Melody. This is Hard Hard Times Times and and True Crimes. Crimes. In 1851, Massachusetts passed one of the first adoption laws in the U.S. Before that, adoption had been about the adults who wanted a child, and things were handled with that focus. As you can imagine, some wanted to adopt a child for the sole purpose of labor and profit. This statute changed the landscape by recognizing adoption as being about the welfare and best interest of the child. It gave judges the responsibility of ensuring the adoption decrees were proper and fit, and how that was determined was largely up to the judge. Adoption was still usually handled in secret, with closed records. Many children grew up never knowing they were adopted, Many women, pregnant out of wedlock, were pressured to give their child up. Some were forced to due to poverty or illness. But with the passing of new laws came new organizations and programs that aided in placing children in loving homes. Some of these were government agencies, some were private, and some were of a religious nature. Even so, most often the records were sealed and information kept from the birth mothers and adopted children. But that would begin to change in the 1950s. Open adoptions began in earnest when Jean Patton, a social worker who had been adopted twice herself, found her own birth mother at the age of 47. She stated, In the soul of every orphan is an internal flame of hope for reunion and reconciliation. Later, open adoption became defined as an adoption in which the birth parents meet the adoptive parent, relinquish all legal, moral, and nurturing rights to the child, but retain the right to continue contact and knowledge of their children's whereabouts and welfare. Today, the landscape has changed even more with the creation of DNA registries, such as 23andMe or Ancestry DNA. Adoptees are finding their birth families more and more often, even without access to those formally closed records. We've come a long way from those early days of secrecy and stigma about adoption. However, many families today are still grappling with the fallout of how things were handled decades ago. Good morning. Good morning. It's been a while since we've gotten together. Yes, it has. We've had some sickness. Yes. Both of our families. Yes. So we apologize. We did not get an episode out last week, but hopefully the ones coming up will make up for that. Yes. So let's just jump right in to mine for today. All right. So back in November, you Mm -hmm. know that I traveled to Florida for a wedding. Yes. So it was the wedding. My my younger sister, um, years ago, she placed a child for adoption. And it was an open adoption. Okay. And so it was her daughter, her biological daughter, that was getting married down there. Oh. Yeah. And I have to say, the open adoption has been so beautiful. Uh, the adoptive parents have been so good to keep us in the loop. Wow. They've stayed in contact with us. They've sent pictures. I love that. Yeah. And so at the wedding, we just, it was so beautiful at the wedding because they really included my sister, the mother, when the bride gave flowers to the mother-in-law and the mother she Mm -hmm. also gave them to my sister and they included her in all the pictures of with the mothers of the bride and bridegroom that is precious yes and so my that's my segue into my story for today okay and so we we all feel like we have a really good close relationship with the adoptive parents and with her daughter you know, we hear a lot of bad adoption stories, yes. but sometimes they can be really good, and especially the open ones. Absolutely. I love that. In the summer of 1891, mm-hmm. George and Beulah Tan gave birth to a little girl in Mississippi. 
They must have really wanted to carry on their names because she was named Beulah after her mother and George after her father. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> but they called her Georgia. Oh, yeah. I, I like, like that name. I do, too. So George's little brother, Rob Roy Tan, was born <laughs> just three years later. As the kids grew up, their home in Hickory, Mississippi, was considered like the, you know, the hangout spot for the neighbor's kids. And they were very open, you know. Right. And her father, who was a judge, at times he had even brought home some children who had been neglected or abandoned and was oh, trying to help find them homes. That's sweet. Yeah. So he was trying to help that process. And Georgie, Georgia, you know, she witnessed how her father had tried to find ways to help those kids. So she grew up in that type of situation. Right. Social justice type situations. Right. So they were kind of like foster parents in a way. I wouldn't say foster parenting. Yes. Before foster parenting. And I wouldn't say that they did it all the time, but as a judge, he came into contact with those situations and um, yes, they were hands on with it. Okay. I love that. So Georgia's father, he wanted her to become a concert pianist. And so he started Georgia in piano lessons at age five. But like some girl, little girls, she hated it. Yeah. That's not what she wanted to do. Nonetheless, you know, those were different times. And so she did graduate from Martha Washington College in Abingdon, Virginia, with a degree in music in 1913. Okay. What she wanted to do, though, was to be a lawyer, as her father had been, and Her father, he did not want her to do that because that just was not a profession for women during those during those years. She did pay close attention to what he did, and she was able to pass the Mississippi bar exam. Oh, that's impressive. That was impressive. But it didn't matter because the law profession, it still was not really available to women during that time. And so um, she ended up taking some social classes or some classes in social work Mm -hmm. for two summers at Columbia University. And so she ended up going into social work. Okay. And I'm sure her early life beginnings, you know, played into that. Yeah. And that was definitely a a women's profession at the time. She was able to obtain a position as a social worker in Texas, and that only lasted a short time. And she then returned to Mississippi and found work at the Mississippi Children's Home Society. And it was there that she ran into an old family friend, Ann Atwood. Okay. Now, is this like a, this home, I guess this would be like a home for children that had lost their parents? Yes. Like orphans, I guess. Orphans. Yeah. Or they had been abandoned or some had been taken out of the home probably because of of poverty and, and, and that kind of thing. Yes. She was the receiving director at the home and her friend Ann worked as a house mother. They struck up their old friendship while they were working there. And at this point is when that we know of that Georgia began using some unusual child placing methods, Mm -hmm. which got her terminated from that job. Oh, what did she do? Um, Well, they they didn't say what she did at that job. Okay. So we'll get a little more into that at some other positions. But it was enough that they let her go. It was enough that they terminated her. Well, it didn't deter her from social work. She proceeded to get a position later at the Tennessee Children's Home Society as the executive secretary. And so when she moved to Tennessee in 1924 for that job, her friend Ann Atwood also moved with her. The two women lived together. Georgia had an adopted daughter at that point named June. And Ann had a son from a previous relationship named Jack. And back then, when the cohabitating of two single women, independent of a man's support, that was actually called a Boston marriage. Really? Mm -hmm. And it was socially, it was a socially acceptable way for, you know, independent women to live and provide for themselves. Right. And I'm sure it made it easier when you had two women working and caring for the children. bringing in it, yeah, and helping each other and bringing in income. Yes. But Tan and Atwood were actually in a romantic relationship that they were hiding. So in order for them to keep the nature of that relationship quiet, Georgia adopted, quote unquote, Anne, who was only eight years her junior. Hmm. Yeah. So sometimes those Boston marriages were legit, you know, just two women helping each other out. But many times it was to hide a romantic relationship. Right. It was like under the guise of a Boston marriage. Exactly. And so sometimes when that was going on, the adoption would happen 
so that if you had two adults in a same sex relationship, Mm -hmm. the other one could inherit the property when the when one of them died. So the adoption was for that purpose. I gotcha. That makes sense. Later, years later, at her death, the newspapers actually called Anne her adopted sister. Okay. So sometimes these these terms get a little yeah loose with the terms, right? Yeah. That's just I uh, just wanted to lay out for you what the nature of that was. Okay. While employed in Memphis, Georgia's questionable work methods mm-hmm. that we talked about they resumed. So we do know what happened at this place. The law at that time it allowed agencies to place children for adoption. In order to curb the selling of children, Mm -hmm. in order to do that, the agencies, they're only allowed to charge a very low fee just for the services. Right. No extras. So that they weren't getting exploited. Exactly. Okay. And at that time, the fee was $7 for an adoption within the state of Tennessee. Georgia began arranging for out-of-state adoptions because these were a little more lucrative she could charge extra fees for mm-hmm. various travel expenses other than like and other miscellaneous items. In fact, she could charge a lot more. These fees could be as much as $700 and up. Okay. The bulk of her adoptions were placed in New York or California to wealthy families. So Georgia had two employees who would deliver babies to her to the, for her to these states. Okay. One would take four to six babies to New York and the other to California approximately like every three weeks. Whoa. The couples would write a check made out to Georgia Tan, personal check, Mm. for those services. And she could charge each couple the travel expenses. So even though four may be traveling at a time, she can charge all four families for the same cost of those tickets. Wow. Okay. So her motives have changed. Her motives have definitely changed. And then she would also charge for other various expenses, such as paperwork that was uh, marked up several times, the actual cost, Mm. overpriced airfare, background checks that she never performed. Wow. And so on. In reality, the actual fees many times would amount to less than $100. And then the excess was pocketed by Georgia Tan. And allegedly, she kept the bulk of the monies, some estimate as much as 80 to 90 percent. Wow. And not surprisingly, uh, much of that was not turned over to the IRS. Yeah, not surprisingly, yes. if she's willing to do all that. So she has discovered a good little side hustle here. Mm-hmm. She was not about to get caught. So using aggressive tactics, she really kind of took over the organization that she worked for within about seven years. And it was termed in what the resources I looked at, it was termed a hostile takeover. With her being at the top, she's able to work with virtually no oversight. Her shady practices actually grow. They're unchecked. Unchecked. And so they can, not only do they continue, but they grow. She needed to keep babies coming in so she could meet the demand of the wealthy who wanted children. And so she began to get orphans by deceptive means, heavy handed threats to single mothers, Legal action threats and bullying. To quote Business Insider, she preyed upon women's desperation, poverty, and sense of shame. Oh. Yeah. That is so sad. It is really, it's a tragic, um, it's just a a tragedy to think about. Mm -hmm. And some have described her as having this threatening air about her. She had short cropped gray hair wireless round glasses, and she just carried herself with an air of authority. To an unwed mother struggling to survive and keep her children fed, it's it was hard to question this woman and stand up to her because she's from the children's home. Right. She comes with some authority behind her. And I'm assuming she's only wanting babies. No, actually, she um, she was getting any kids that she could get. Now, really? Of course, she probably... Had an age limit. Yes, probably yeah. so. She focused on the babies, but Mm -hmm. if she couldn't get them, she was not beyond getting older children. Wow, okay. I've been on the receiving end of some medical personnel questioning my medical decisions for my children. Right. And I remember you telling me. I felt bullied like I didn't have a choice. And as a young mother, I didn't know I could question those things. Yeah. Now, when I was an older mother, I had found my place and I put my foot down. Mama Bear came out. I put my foot down. Yes. 
but as a young mother, I just did what I was told. Right. I didn't know any different. Right. Because it's scary. It is scary. So this money making business for Georgia was going well. She actually had some pretty high profile clients. She placed babies with Joan Crawford. Your, oh, you know, Mommy, Mommy Dearest. Dearest. Okay. Yes. And other Hollywood stars from that time, June Allison and Dick Powell, which I didn't know who those who they were as well. But at the time, they were they were big movie stars. Mm -hmm. And a little interesting side fact, pro wrestler Ric Flair yes. was placed with his adoptive parent through Mrs. Tan's agency. Really? Yep. And they that was in his biography. Wow. Now, were they good parents to him? I did not read that far. Okay. My brother will know. <laughs> so we'll have to ask him. Yes. Before the end of the episode, let me call him. Okay. Because he will know. Okay. So we paused for a second so Darlene could ask her brother. What did he tell you, Darlene? He said, yes, that he had, he said that his adoptive parents were awesome to him and he did have a good life. That's great. It is. And I don't think he ever knew his biological mother okay you know she obviously did place make some good placements mm -hmm. i mean many people most i would say most people wanting children yeah want them for legitimate reasons to you know not just for selfish reasons although i will say in researching this i did find out that many times um people who wanted children were wanting them for work labor on their farms right many times so and oftentimes you might want a child, but it doesn't mean it, it doesn't mean that you're um, like when they get there, it's a lot different mm -hmm. than what you think it's going to be. And so just because you want a child doesn't make you a great parent. Very true. I am so glad you pointed that out. By 1941, the Child Welfare League of America had dropped the Children's Society from their list of approved institutions. So they were catching on. They were catching on, but they did not realize that she actually had a full-on black market baby ring going. Mm. To get children to place, she had to be a little more heavy-handed, and she needed accomplices to do what she was doing. Right. So she started turning to her contacts in the system to get babies from women in mental institutions. She sometimes would have poor women sign their babies over while they were still under sedation in the hospital. Oh, my gracious. She would visit nursery schools and take children from poor families. Mm. When the mothers would arrive to get their children, they were told the welfare agency had taken them. That is unbelievable. Can you imagine that this happened in the 1920s and 30s no. and 40s in America? That is crazy. And I'm guessing. Oh, yeah, that's that's awful. Yeah. And in, like, I'm sure that they, what happened like when they would report it? Well, we'll get to that because okay. I'm going to give you some stories of some real life stories. Okay. And so great. you'll see what happened. She also falsified records, destroyed records of adoptions that she had processed. She threatened concerned prospective parents if they would question inaccurate information about their babies. She would kind of threaten them to take the babies back. She it wasn't even an empty threat. She um it wasn't beyond her reach to take the baby back and she it wasn't just a threat. So I'm guessing she was paying off people like yes. in the system. Well, we don't know exactly uh if she was paying them off or, or if she, they just believed her. Yes. Okay. And and I will also get into that a little more. So you actually have some really good questions. Uh, I hope I can answer them all. Okay. So, and it is said, like, the more power she got, the more that went unchecked, like you mm -hmm. said, the more domineering she became and the more threatening. And sure, she, she sure. started feeling like she was untouchable. Yeah. She insulated herself from getting caught by keeping company with others that, who were also in wealth and power positions. Miss Tan had a friend in the family court judge, Camille Kelly who really was complicit in these practices. Mm. Judge Kelly went as far as taking children from divorced mothers and turning them over to Tan to place in other families. That is awful. It is rarely. I mean, it's just, it's hard to believe. It is. These women working together, they just thought they knew better than God who, who deserves children and who didn't. And yeah, but but I doubt, like for for Georgia Tan anyway, that she had the children's best interest at heart. I feel like it was financially motivated. It definitely was financially motivated, but her the way she chose children was mm -hmm. exploitative. Oh yeah, 
but she did choose those people that she thought didn't deserve children. Right. Because I'm guessing because they were poor. Yeah. Is- and she felt totally okay about taking babies from poor families and placing them with the ones that she felt were more deserving. Because some of her quotes where she said, I placed them with those of the higher type. Oh, okay. So she was making choices about who was worthy to, to get them. But I'm sure what played a part in that was the money. And you and I both grew up in poor households. And yes. thank God that, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm so grateful for for my upbringing. Now, it wasn't always easy, but I just, I don't know. I can't imagine. Like, my mom was a great mom. Right. And my dad was a great dad. Um, and so, I don't know. It is hard to imagine if you had if you had lived back then, mm-hmm. what could have happened? Yes. Well, Georgia also had she was chummy with former mayor of Memphis. His name was E. H. Boss, and he had a lot of political power, and he was also known to be corrupt and take bribes and that sort of thing. And she okay. was very chummy with him as well. Mm-hmm. So she had some people in her pocket for sure. And she was known to hobnob, you know, and go to these, you know, dinners and host and stuff to hobnob with these people who could help her. Okay, real quick. Sorry, I'm Mm -hmm. not trying to talk. You can cut this out. But I'm thinking people are probably going to believe her over over these poverty stricken mothers or if they if they disagree with their lifestyle or whatever you know they're thinking that this lady probably really does know best absolutely so maybe they just really do trust her yes absolutely although her connections kept her from scrutiny not everyone was a supporter because more than a couple of doctors had filed complaints against her home over the years ah One doctor prescribed antibiotics to a baby who was sick with an infection, Mm -hmm. and Miss Tan instructed her staff to not administer the antibiotics. Really? The doctor said she felt she knew better than they did about how to take uh, how to care for the babies. Wow! So she has this sense of arrogancy too. Yeah. In the mid 1940s, one physician had advised her not to take in any more babies because there was a dysentery epidemic going through her home. Right. She did not take that advice, and as many as 40 to 50 babies died due to that. First of all, she had 40 or 50 babies in her care. Yes. And second of all, oh my goodness, 40 or 50 died. Yes. And that was just that one physician's estimation of that. Oh my goodness. And, And you know to have that many babies, like you just said, I could see it in your face, you know they are not being cared for no. the way they need to be. Exactly. And I will talk about some of those methods in just a moment as well. Okay. She becomes so brazen that in late 1944, she spoke in front of a group of Memphis civic leaders to point out the problems with the Tennessee adoption situation. In her speech, she had the gall to state publicly, and I quote, the shortage of adoptable babies, I believe, is due to the thriving black market in babies. <laughs> now, how crazy is that? <laughs> that is, that's something. And then she continued in an irate voice, this is because doctors, lawyers, and private individuals are arranging adoptions without a license to do so. There is a fine for such actions. Wow. Wow. And doesn't she sound just so self-righteous? Yes. But really, she doesn't like them horning in on her money-making business is what it is. Exactly. She went on to continue that the Tennessee Children's Home Society was the only one in the state licensed to receive children for guardianship pending adoption. So it sounds like they were cutting into her profits. Mm -hmm. And at this point, she is literally flat out kidnapping children. Really? Yes. Like just taking them? Yes. And I'm going to tell you the story of one in particular. I mean, to have that many babies, there's no way that she has their best interest at heart. No way. Because there's no way that they're receiving the care that they need or the love or, you know, all the things we know babies need. One of those stories was reported in 1990. The LA Times ran a story about a woman named Alma Sipple. She was an unwed mother who was in her early 20s in 1946. She had a two-year-old son, Robert, and an infant daughter named Irma. Sipple planned to be married to her boyfriend of two years, Johnny Talos, who was the father of the the little girl. Mm -hmm. But he was in the Air Force and had been shipped off to Panama. So they were waiting. Yeah. 
And so Alma had then moved with her two children to Memphis, where they lived in a one-room apartment awaiting Johnny's return. Shortly after that move, Alma took her children for a walk one day. And she was a, and she probably lived in like these uh, low income apartments. Right. You know, she was living in poverty. She was approached by a woman who gave her name as Georgia Tan. And the lady said, I'm from the children's home. As she engaged Alma in conversation, she started asking personal questions about the baby's father and stuff like that. And she pointed out the baby had some cold symptoms, you know, runny nose and that kind of thing. She pointed out, you know, your baby looks sick. And she recommended that Alma get the baby checked by a doctor. When Alma stated she did not have the money for a doctor's visit, Georgia then offered to take the baby to Memphis General Hospital for her. Okay. The next day, Alma Sipple went to the hospital and found her little girl jumping up and down in bed, looking healthy. Okay. When Alma asked to see her baby, a nurse told her that she didn't have a baby there. Those babies belonged to the Children's Home Society. Oh, my gosh. And, of course, Alma was shocked, and she immediately began to try and get a hold of Miss uh, Tan Mm -hmm. to no avail. And she's persisting. And when she finally was able to reach her, Miss Tan told her told her that she was so sorry, but her baby had died of pneumonia. Oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. And she had just seen the baby a few days before that, jumping up and down and looking very so healthy. she knew that was a lie. She knew that was a lie. Uh, she was devastated, and she still wants to see, well, then I want to see my deceased right. baby. Right. Georgia rebuffed her, and she said she had already taken care of those arrangements. And it was done. It, she said, it's done. Oh, my gosh. That is heartbreaking. Oh, my gosh. That breaks my heart for her. I I'm just know. thinking, like. So, of course, this poor woman, Alma, she is beyond consolation. She wanted to see her baby's grave. And there was none. They could not point mm-hmm. her to anything. She continued to reach out to the children's home. And they, they pretty much ghosted her, you know. They were avoiding her calls. She was told that Tan had nothing else to say to her. And now she has no resources at her disposal. I mean, there's no way for her to find out anything further. They just completely shut her down. And she literally was at a dead end in her search for her baby. But she did know deep down her baby was not gone. She just had no choice but to go on with life. And she did that. And it was very bleak. She turned to alcohol for a while. I mean, you can understand that. Her relationship with the baby's father, Johnny, it ended Mm -hmm. because he couldn't take it. And so she ends up moving back to Kentucky with her son. Mm -hmm. She was from Kentucky originally. And and life goes on. She actually went on to marry two more times. Mm -hmm. She had, uh, I think, five or six more children. Right. Her third marriage was to a man named Steve Sipple, and he had a child as well. So together they have several children. Throughout those years, she never gave up searching for her daughter. So it was through one of her searches in 1982 that she found out there was no death certificate at all in her daughter's name, which was Irma Talos. But something else would soon happen that just rocked her world. Before I tell you about the end of Alma's story, Mm -hmm. let's back up and return to Ms. Tan's crimes in the 1940s. Okay. While a child was waiting to be placed for adoption, they would be held in public facilities or what we would call a foster home. Mm -hmm. Many of those were unvetted at that time. One wealthy donor gifted a large mansion to the children's home in order to house the children. It was staffed by women appearing to be nurses. They they wore all white uniforms, but none of them actually had medical training. And Uh, many of them were substance abusers. In later years, once these stories began to come out, some of the staff would refer to this as a house of horrors. Oh. During that time, many of the kids were kept sedated. Now, you talked about those older kids. Yes. Some of Maybe if you're not a baby, but you're a little older, kept oh. sedated. There were reports of neglect, abuse, sexual abuse, mm. and even murder. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Some died of malnutrition. Many others disappeared and were never accounted for. Were they not like coming and checking? The state not coming in and checking at all on these children? I'm assuming they did not. Maybe she just, they just trusted her. 
That is, who knows? I mean, this was the 40s. Yeah, a different time. Some sources state that 500 or more children died due to neglect or mistreatment. Even when staff or medical personnel would report what they observed, it seemed that she was untouchable. And she worked hard to oppose any attempt at a model adoption law. Because, again, we didn't have those adoption laws in Mm -hmm. place like we do today. Right. And her story and her crimes are part of what has, is why we have some of the laws we do have today. Okay. But she worked hard to thwart a model adoption law that would make it all but impossible to operate a black market. So here we have a story of a woman who had adopted from Ms. Tan. Dr. Ernest Kelly and his wife, they had adopted one of Ms. Tan's children's home babies about 10 years prior. And in 1949, they were uh, asked to come to Nashville to speak in favor of a bill that would help regulate adoptions and protect children. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Kelly, she was a social worker herself. She was representing the American Association of College Women, and she came to speak before a legislative committee to support the bill. After finishing her speech, Mrs. Kelly ran into Ms. Tan in the hall, and she said, I hope you understand how I felt. There's no ill feeling against the home. Yeah. So, again, she's not aware of all of these practices going sure. on. She got a baby from there. As far as she knows, it's all uh, up yeah, and up. Great. But Ms. Tan looked at her and replied, I certainly do know how you felt. And then added, rather in a hostile way, I think you should know that I recently received a letter from the mother of your child. Like, very threatening. I mean, it unsettled Mrs. Kelly because she perceived it as a threat to reveal her child's family name and possibly to try to take her child back. It caused quite a stir. Uh, Some complaints were made against Mm -hmm. her and the control that Ms. Tan was trying to assert over foster families, but it didn't lead to anything at that time. It did not go anywhere. Finally, on September 11, 1950, Mm -hmm. an investigation was launched into the society by Tennessee Governor Gordon Browning. And do we know why or we don't? We do. Word reached him that babies were being sold and he was not in Georgia Tan's back pocket as some of those other politicians had been. Within three days of that launch, before any charges could be made, Ms. Georgia Tan died at her home from untreated uterine cancer on September 15th. Oh, my goodness. She passed away without even knowing she was being investigated and with with never being held accountable for her crimes here on this side. Yes. Shortly after her death, the Children's Home Board retained internal investigators And after looking into the allegations, they issued a report stating that the state's charges were true. Tan had made money from the adoptions that she had not reported to the Children's Home Board. That spurred a more extensive investigation. Mm -hmm. And she was actually accused of bringing in at least a million million dollars in profits, which today would be equal to about more than 11 million. Mm -hmm. She was buried in her family's plot in Hickory Cemetery. When her will was read, some were surprised to hear that she had not left one penny to charity, not to the children's home that she had claimed was so dear to her heart, which was her life's work. She had left everything to her mother, her adopted daughter, and her adopted sister, quote unquote, Mm -hmm. uh, partner, Ann Atwood. And while she had amassed quite a fortune through her baby stealing racket, she had also spent quite a bit of it. So it was estimated she only had a small percentage of it left when she died. She did have multiple properties. The state of Tennessee sued her estate, claiming she had misappropriated more than $500,000 in funds that belonged to them. Yeah. The media printed more and more of these stories about her tactics, and I've read several newspaper accounts from back then. And then the investigation starts revealing more and more abuses. But there was nothing they could do to to prosecute for her crimes. One of her accomplices, that family court judge, Camille Kelly, they just determined that she didn't actually know what was going on. And so she didn't, she was not held accountable for her help in that. She may have felt that she was doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Who would know? But the lawsuit from the state of Tennessee ended up being settled out of court with the heirs agreeing to give two thirds of the $82,000 estate, which was what they said was left. Mm. 
in the aftermath because of all of the abuse and uh, allegations and that kind of thing, the Tennessee Children's Home Society closed its doors permanently around the end of 1950. Thank God. For real. And I want to point out, it's not affiliated in any way with the current Tennessee Children's Home of today, which is accredited by the state of Tennessee. Okay. So let's return to the story of Alma Sippel. Mm -hmm. Remember how her baby had basically been literally kidnapped from her. Yes. And she was told her daughter had died. Well, one day in the late 1980s, Alma was flipping channels on the TV. We probably cannot imagine her shock when she saw the face of the woman who had taken her baby right there on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries. Oh, my goodness. She let out a scream. There was no mistake that that was the woman who had taken Irma. So at the end of the show, viewers were told they could contact the Tennessee's Right to Know organization for help Mm -hmm. finding families that they had been separated from. Right. They received over 600 calls from that episode. And it was a blessing because seven months later, Alma found her daughter. She got a phone number and she made the call. That call was made to a young woman now uh, living as Sandra Kimbrell. That was her daughter's adopted name. And Sandra had known she had been adopted, uh, but she had never tried to find her birth mother. She said she grew up in a good home as well. She was placed with a good family. She had a great, she said she had a great life. Sure. And so even though she had been curious, uh, it wasn't, she was never, you know, motivated and felt a need at that point yet to go in search but now that they had talked on the phone i Mm -hmm. mean you can imagine how surreal that must have felt yeah it makes me want to cry yes they were able to just get caught up on all the things Mm -hmm. they had missed sandra you know was somewhat surprised to find out she now had eight siblings i'm sure (laughs) she had been raised as an only child wow she was a nurse she was married she had two children of her own Alma and Sandra, they're trying to work through, like, what would a relationship look like now? Yeah. You know, there's no going back. No. So they did eventually decide to meet face to face. That article in the LA Times printed pictures of Uh the siblings and them all together. It was a sweet reunion. I love that. Yeah. It had come full circle for Alma, who said she now felt whole. And remember, this was a little uh, little side note that made me sad. You remember her son Robert was two when that happened? Yes. He said he had grown up all those years thinking he had killed his sister because oh. just before she had been taken away, he had like bonked her on the head with a toy Jeep. Oh. And he's two. And all the and next thing he knows, they're telling her she went to the hospital and she died. And so as a child, he carried that with him thinking it was his fault. That is horrible. S- the heart wrenching. Yes. Yeah, that story did have a better ending than yeah. some. There are still some people who never found their birth mothers or their birth children because of those crimes committed right. by Georgia Tan. It is believed that Georgia Tan stole over 5,000 babies mm-hmm. in that money racket. Many of those victims have passed on. Mm-hmm. And so for the ones who never found their birth child before they died, I mean, that's just a tragic ending for them. Yes, it is. They carried that with them to their grave. Today in the Elmwood Cemetery in Memphis, there's a memorial representing some of those who died in the care of Georgia Tan. This is partially what is inscripted on it. In memory of the 19 children who finally rest here, unmarked, if not unknown, Mm -hmm. and of all the hundreds who died under the cold, hard hand of the Tennessee Children's Home Society. Their final resting place unknown, their final peace a blessing. The hard lesson of their fate changed adoption procedure and law nationwide. And that is the story of Georgia Tan, the baby thief. Those sure were some hard times. They sure were. Now I grew up with four brothers and four sisters. And I can tell you with great certainty... I was not adopted, and there's no use in crying over spilt milk. And if spending this holiday season with your siblings has left you wondering what it would have been like to have been abandoned on someone else's doorstep, we're here to help. I'll personally guarantee you that nothing will make time with your socially awkward, emotionally damaged family more enjoyable 
than listening to hard times and true crimes. So you make sure you tell everybody you're related to, and a few people you're not, to check us out. Till next time, goodbye.